Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I'm uh, Tim Fry, the uh, director of uh, the Harriman Institute, and I'm uh, really honored uh, to welcome uh, uh, Gary Steingart, the uh, award-winning author and Harriman faculty member. Uh, yeah. And he'll read from his uh, newly released memoir, Faluruchka, uh, Little Failure, which published with Random House. Um, uh, as you all know, he's written three highly acclaimed uh, novels, and now he's turned to nonfiction writing in this memoir. And we have uh, books for sale in the back. And we also uh, want to thank Gary for sitting for an interview for our Harriman magazine, which will be uh, out shortly, and which you can get either in hard copy or you can uh, pick up on our website. Um, Steingart was born in uh, Soviet Leningrad, uh, where he spent seven years as a child, and he was fiercely devoted to Lenin and his Rodina. Then uh, he moved to Queens in New York, uh, finished Oberlin College, um, and uh, uh, he uh, then became most well-known as a prodigious blurber, um, and he's also fine time on the side to write three highly acclaimed novels, The Russian Debutante's Handbook, where we meet uh, Vladimir Girshkin, the fan man, and the bronze horseman, which has been mysteriously removed to Prague. Um, then we have uh, Absurdistan, where we meet Alyosha Bob, Misha Weinberg, the son of the 1,238th richest man in Russia, and that conniving Jerry Steinfarb. And of course, the mountain Jews who save our hero. Uh, then in Super Sad Love Story, we see in New York of the uh, uh, not too distant future where Staten Island is hip. And there are credit poles hanging around the city which reveal the passers-by net worth so you can figure out whether you need to ignore the person or not. Uh, in each of these novels, we get writing which one critic wrote uh, was a combination of Nabokov and Woody Allen, which I think really meets, uh, uh, really, I think, hits the target uh, very well. Um, so without further ado, I give you Gary Steingart, who will read from Little Failure. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Can everyone hear me? Is this okay? Yeah? Okay. Woo! Uh, great to be here at Columbia. I teach here, I think, right? That's right. That's okay. Right <laughs> it's always surprising, yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, good to be back in the Morningside Heights. Um, critics have agreed that the best thing about this book is by far the cover. Um, it's a picture of me. I'm about a year and a half old in Leningrad. Uh, 1974, and uh, they had these photo studios uh, where you could put your child with the latest in Soviet technology. Uh, in this case, it's this Studebaker, um, or Volga, actually. And um, there's various pictures of me in different poses crying in front of, here I'm crying in front of a telephone, for example. Uh, so uh, the pictures are the best part of this book. Um, and only until this year, at age 41, did I finally learn how to drive. I was always so scared of automobiles. So watch out, New York. Uh, seriously, watch out. I'm a terrible, terrible driver. Um, people, the book is really about how I became a, a writer. And, and people often ask me that question. I teach at the creative writing program uh, at, uh, you know, across the uh, campus. Um, how do you become a writer? Well, first, to become a writer, you have to be uh, very asthmatic. Uh, <laughs> There's no way around that. You've got to have asthma quite badly. Um, so I would grow up in a cold, damp place like Leningrad, which is actually built over a swamp, so it's, it's perfect. Uh, and in 1974, in the Soviet Union, there were no steroid inhalers for asthma, so you really got to see mortality up close as a child because you were always about to die. Um, I still remember the wail of the ambulances in our courtyard always coming to take me away to the hospital. Uh, very good stuff for a writer. Uh, then you've got to have a grandmother who writes. Uh, my grandmother, Galia, was a journalist for a paper called Evening Leningrad, Vicherny uh, Leningrad, which is much better than uh, Morning Leningrad. Uh, that was sort of the, the TMZ of... of <laughs> I made that joke in L.A., and then I realized, oh, half the audience writes for TMZ. Um, but we're in safe ground here in New York. Um, so one day when I was five years old, my grandmother said to me, hey, asthma boy, you know, you want to be a novelist, no? And she said, I'll give you a piece of cheese for every page you write. And I loved that, that cheese, that kind of plasticky yellow Soviet cheese. Um, and right outside the window was the biggest statue of Lenin in Leningrad, uh, for those of you who know the city, it's Moskovskaya Ploshid, mm -hmm. beautiful statue. Uh, we called him the Latin Lenin because he always looked like he was about to rumba. He had this <laughs> sort of... So every morning when I wasn't dying from asthma, I'd get up and I would hug Lenin around this pedestal. That's, 
how much I loved him. Uh, so my first novel for my grandmother was called Lenin and His Magical Goose. Uh, and in it, Lenin meets a goose, possibly from Armenia or Georgia, someplace warm. And together they invade Finland and try to create a socialist revolution there. Uh, then Lenin and the goose get into a huge political fight. One of the first pictures in this book is me wearing the typical thing that you wear as a five-year-old Russian child, which is a sailor outfit. This alone constitutes about seven years of psychoanalysis. <laughs> uh, and I'm reading this hefty Talmudic tome, which is actually all about the uh, Civil War of 1917. I was, like most R Soviet kids, obsessed with the Civil War of 1917. So in my book, uh, they, they fly to Finland. They start the Socialist Revolution. That goes well. But then we find out that the goose is Menshevik, and Lenin, of course, is Bolshevik. So Lenin eats the goose. Uh, <laughs> And my grandmother loved it, but she said, you know, um, said, well, maybe he doesn't eat the goose. Maybe he exiles the goose to Mexico and <laughs> ice pick, no, ice pick, you know. <laughs> and she paid me 100 pieces of cheese for the 100-page novel. Uh, and even today, Random House pays me in cheese. <laughs> so there's a kind of symmetry there. Um, and then we emigrated to uh, America, and we had to leave Lenin behind. And I had to learn English and also some Hebrew because I was sentenced to eight years of Hebrew school for a crime I did not commit. But, <laughs> you know. And 1980 was a difficult time to be a Russian in America. You remember Ronald Reagan's Evil Empire speech and all those movies, Red Dawn, Red Gerbil, Red Hamster, everything was red. You know. And I pretended to the kids in Hebrew school that I was actually born in East Berlin, not in Leningrad. <laughs> you know things are bad when you have to convince Jewish kids that you're actually a German. Uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, we were really poor. I had one shirt, one pair of pants, and a bunch of T-shirts that the parents of the kids in Hebrew school had donated, and my toys were a pen and a Chewbacca action figure someone had given us that was missing half of his paw. And I had come from Russia, so you know I had a fur coat and a fur hat made out of some woodland animal, and the teachers would actually take me aside and say, you really need to get rid of your fur. Uh, kids will play with you more if you're you know, furless. Uh, <laughs> which is actually true in adulthood as well. Um, and then two years after we left Russia, something truly incredible happened that almost changed our lives forever. And I'll, I'll read you this section and then two other sections from the book. In 1981, an official letter arrives in our mailbox. Mr. S. Shitgart, you have already won $10 million. Sure, our last name is misspelled rather cruelly, but cardstock this thick does not lie. And the letter is from a major American publisher, to wit, the publisher's clearing house. I open the letter with shaking hands and a check falls out. Paid to the order of S. Shitgart, 10 million and 00 slash $100. Our lives are about to change. I run down the stairs into the courtyard of our apartment complex. Mama, Papa, we won. We won. We, millionaires. We are millionaires. Uspakoise, my father says. Calm down. Do you want another asthma attack? but he is nervous and excited himself. Talk, talk, let us see what we have here. Around the glowing surface of the orange dining table imported from Romania, we spread around the contents of the voluminous packet. For two years, we have been good new citizens, watching X-rated movies with titles like Emmanuel, The Scent of a Woman, getting jobs as engineers, learning to pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and for the something for which that it stands, <laughs> unavoidable with money for all. <laughs> Boże moi, my mother says, my God, as we look at the pictures of a Mercedes flying off the deck of our yacht toward our new mansion with its Olympic-sized swimming pool. Oi, does it have to be a Mercedes? Pfu, Nazis. <laughs> Don't worry, we can trade for a Cadillac. Boże moi, how many bedrooms does this house have? Seven, eight, nine. You said the kids at school have houses like this. No, Papa, this one, ours will be bigger. Well, the way I understand it, the house doesn't come with the prize. The prize is just $10 million, and then we buy the house separately. Phew, they always say here, sold separately. <laughs> you can forget about the yacht, Gary. It's dangerous. But I know how to swim, Mama. How do you keep the pool open in winter? Maybe the house is in Miami. I want to live in Miami. Maybe there aren't Hebrew schools in Miami. <laughs> Everywhere in America, there are Hebrew schools. <laughs> We sit down and using our collective, collective 400 word English vocabulary, begin to unravel the many documents before us. Wait, it says here that yes, we have already won the $10 million, no disputing that, but a panel of judges 
still has to award the money to us. First, we must fill out the so-called winner's form and to select five national magazines that will be sent to us free, <laughs> or at least the first issue of each will be free, and then the Americans will likely send us the rest of the $10 million. Fair enough. First, we must acclimate to our new wealth, expand our literacy. I am proud of Papa's new car, a bulbous 1977 Chevrolet Malibu Classic with only 7 million miles in the odometer. But it's time to get acquainted with the finer autos. So I order car and motor, motor and driver, carburetor and driver, muffler and owner. <laughs> and for the last selection, something that has my Star Wars monkey, Chewy Chewbacca, in it, Isaac Asimov Science Fiction Magazine. I walk solemnly to the mailbox and deposit our claim on the future. Adonai Eloheinu, I pray to our new God, please help us get the new $10 million <laughs> so that Mama and Papa will not fight so much <laughs> and there will be no razvod, divorce between them <laughs> and let us live somewhere far away from Papa's wolfish relatives <laughs> who cause all the trouble mm -hmm. and let them not yell at Mama when she sends the money Papa says we don't have to her sisters and Grandma Gale in Leningrad who has been dying for a very long time. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> That night, in my dreams, I walk into the Solomon Schefter School of Queens, a multi-millionaire. And the pretty girl with the big teeth, who's always tanned from Florida vacation, kisses me with those big teeth. I haven't gotten the mechanics of kissing down yet. <laughs> the kids make fun of Jonah Himmelstein, the school's biggest loser, but I say, hey, he's my friend now. Here is two dollars. Buy us both the Carvel flying saucer cookie ice cream <laughs> and keep the change, you gurnished, you nothing. <laughs> We find out the truth quickly and brutally. At their respective workplaces, my parents are told that the publisher's clearinghouse regularly sends out the you have already won $10 million missive and that these are routinely thrown in the trash by the savvy native born. Depression settles over our non-millionaire shoulders. In Russia, the government was constantly telling us lies. Wheat harvest is up. Uzbek baby goats give milk at an all-time high. Soviet crickets learn to sing the Internationale in honor of Brezhnev's visit to a local hayfield. <laughs> but we cannot imagine that they would lie to our faces like that here in America, the land of the this and the home of the that. <laughs> and so we don't give up hope entirely. The judges are probably reading our application right now. Maybe I should write them a letter in my burgeoning English. Dear Publishers Clearinghouse, spring is here. The weather is warm and rainy. Birds come from south and sing songs. My mother's pianist fingers hurt very much from her typing clerk job, and she has only one suit for work. Please send us $10 million immediately. We love you, family Steingart. <laughs> Meanwhile, car and parking and the other publishers' clearinghouse magazines are starting to pile up, taunting us with the many hot, naked centerfolds of the new Porsche 911, the official sports coupe of Reagan-era excess. We reluctantly begin to cancel our subscription to all of them, except for Asimov Science Fiction Magazine, a small, square little number with the drawing of an exciting, molting space creature on the cover, hugging a boy just like me in its claws. Our dreams of being instantly rich are finished, but we are moving up nonetheless. We are saving every kopeck that comes our way via my father's junior engineering job and my mother's typing. Here's our inventory. I have my pen, my broken Chewbacca monkey, my recently circumcised penis, the Mozart candy wrapper from Vienna Airport, my Soviet atlas, and a bunch of donated t-shirts. My mother has her size 2 Harv Bernard business suit. My father has made a fishing rod out of a stick. Pounds of disgusting markdown farmer's cheese and kasha will feed us until we die of sadness. And if I don't clear my, pla my plate of that warm crap, the thunderclap of Papa's hand rings against my temple. My mother yelling, just don't hit his head. He's got to make money with his head. <laughs> or Mama's week-long silent treatment will make me consider taking my own life altogether. Who are we? Parents, me biedni. We are poor folk. Why can't I have Chewbacca with both paws? Parents, we are not Americans. Both paws. <laughs> But you both have jobs, parents. We have to buy a house. Yes, a house. The first step to Americanism. Who needs two-handed chewy when we will soon have our own quasi-suburban home? But at lunchtime, the Hebrew school boys do like to take out their Lukes and Obi-Wans and Yodas and set them on their desk to demonstrate just how much property falls within their purview. They talk in their already raspy Jewish voices. I threw out my old Yoda because the paint on his ears was falling off, and then I got two new ones and a Princess Leia just so Ham Solo could do her. <laughs> Me, amazed. Wow. <laughs> so um, I wrote Lenin and his magical goose 
because I wanted all that Soviet cheese, but I also wanted my grandmother to love me, and that was the easiest way to get her love. And so the terrible connection was forged in my mind that writing novels equals love. <laughs> what was I thinking you know, today? <laughs> Most novelists aren't exactly loved, or, or read even. I gave a reading at a university a few years ago. I'm not going to mention the University of Oklahoma by name. Uh, <laughs> but a student there said, you know, excuse me, Mr. Schickart, uh, how do I know when a book's been fictionated? <laughs> and I said, what? <laughs> And she said, you know, like when it's not true. And I said, well, it says novel or stories on it, you know. She said, well, thank you. I'm going to avoid those from now on because I only want things to be true. And so I'm proud to have my first nonfiction and native <laughs> book uh, with me today. I'm sure it's selling big in Norman. Huge in Norman seller, all of my books. Uh, I'm big in Norman. <laughs> Uh, but back to life after not winning the Publishers Clearinghouse Sweepstakes. Because I was the, the red gerbil, the second most hated boy in Hebrew school, I thought, what if I wrote a science fiction novel and showed it to all the kids in school? Maybe they'll learn to like me. And these specimens still exist. Uh, my parents were kind enough to save them. Uh, hundreds of pages in little child scrawl. This one's called Invasion from Outer Space. Take a look inside. Chapter 1, Something is Wrong. <laughs> And boy, was it, you know. <laughs> Someone called child services. Uh, <laughs> and then when I was about 11 years old, a momentous thing happened in the guise of a substitute teacher at Hebrew school called Miss S. Mm -hmm. On one of her first days on the job, Miss S asked us all to bring in our favorite items in the world and to explain why they make us who we are. I bring in my latest toy, a dysfunctional Apollo rocket whose capsule pops off with the press of a lever, but only under certain atmospheric condition. Humidities must be below 54%. And explain that I have even written my own novel. This part passes largely unremarked as the latest batch of Star Wars X-Wing fighters and My Little Ponies are paraded around. Finally, Miss S holds up a sneaker and explains that her favorite activity is jogging. P.U., a boy cries out, pointing at the sneaker and holding his nose as everyone except me laughs their wicked child laugh. I am shocked. Here is a young, kind, pretty teacher, and the children are intimating that her feet smell. Only me and my 200-pound Leningrad fur are allowed to smell around here. I look to Miss S, so worried that she will cry, but instead she laughs and then go on, goes on about how running makes her feel good. After we have all finished explaining who we are, Miss S calls me over to her desk. You really wrote a novel, she asks. Yes, I say. Hmm. It is called The Challenge. May I read it? Yes, you may read it. I will brink it. <laughs> and brink it I do. <laughs> With the worried admonition, please don't lose Miss S, okay? <laughs> and then it happens. At the end of the English period, when a book about a mouse who has somehow learned how to fly in an airplane has been thoroughly dissected, Miss S announces, and now Gary will read from his novel. His what? Oh, but it doesn't matter, because I'm standing there holding my composition notebook straight from the square deal notebook people of Dayton, Ohio, zip code 45463. And looking out at me are the boys beneath their little flying saucer yarmulkes, and the girls with their sweet aromatic bangs, their blouses studded with stars. And there's Miss S, who I'm already terribly in love with, but who I recently learned has a fiancé, not sure what that means, can't be good, <laughs> but whose bright American face is not just encouraging me, but priding me on. Am I scared? No, I am eager, eager to begin my life. Introduction, I say. The mysterious race. Before the age of dinosaurs, there was human life on Earth. They looked just like man of today, but they were a lot more intelligent than man of today. Slowly, Miss S says. Read slowly, Gary. Let us enjoy the words. I breathe that in. Miss S wants to enjoy my words. And then slower, they built all kinds of spaceships and other wonders. But at that time, the Earth circled the moon because the moon was bigger than the Earth. One day, a gigantic comet came and blew up the moon to the size it is today. As I'm reading it, I'm hearing a different language come out of my mouth. I do full justice to the many misspellings. The Earth circled the moon, and the Russian accent is still thick. But I'm speaking in what is more or less comprehensible English. And as I am speaking, along with my strange new English voice, I am also hearing something entirely foreign to the squealing and shouting that constitutes the background noise of my Hebrew school. Silence. The children are silent. They are listening to my every word, and they will listen to the story for the next five weeks as well, because Miss S will designate the end of every English period as Gary novel time, and they will shout out throughout the English period, When will Gary read already? The school is close to Long Island. Uh, 
and I will sit there in my chair, oblivious to all but Miss S's smile, excused from following the discussion of the mouse who learned how to fly, so that I may go over the words I will soon read to my adoring audience. And God bless these kids for giving me a chance. May their God bless them, everyone. <laughs> So in the meantime, because uh, most Soviet immigrants are quite conservative, I've subscribed to another little magazine called the National Review. <laughs> William F. Buckley Jr., editor, Margaret Thatcher on the cover, on every cover. Uh, and then I am sent a thick card featuring an American eagle sitting upon two rifles. That's right, Gary Steingart, age 11, is being welcomed into the National Rifle Association. <laughs> uh, can't start too soon with the NRA. Hmm. Uh, my republicanism flourished even as I left the provinces of eastern Queens and ended up at Stuyvesant High School, the holding pen for multinational math and science nerds in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And then my political, political allegiances underwent a change, and it happened like this. On election day 1988, I come to the Marriott Marquis Ballroom thinking this is the day, the day I will finally get laid. I have volunteered for George Bush Sr.'s scorched earth presidential campaign against the hapless Michael Dukakis, laughing along with Bush's racist, hysterical Willie Horton commercials and all they imply about the liberal Massachusetts Greek. Compassion, after all, is a virtue only rich Americans can afford. Tolerance is the purview of slick Manhattanites who already have everything I want. I'm invited to attend what is sure to be a Republican victory party at the Marriott Marquis, the ugly slab of a building near Times Square. The invitation to the party features a scornful cartoon of the big ear Dukakis sticking his head out of an M1 Abrams tank, the most unfortunate photo op of the campaign. And I expect an evening of arrogant crowing of being pressed to the bosom of my fellow conservatives while dancing a Protestant horror <laughs> over the grave of American liberalism. Yes, tonight is a special night. It's the night I'm to meet a Republican girl from a clean white home. Her name will be Jane, Jane Carruthers, let's say. <laughs> Hi, Jane, I'm Gary Steingart from Little Neck. Uh, my family owns a Dutch colonial worth 280,000 US dollars. Uh, I'm the brains behind a Commodore 64 program called the Family Real Estate Transaction Calculator. Uh, I go to Stuyvesant High School where my grades aren't so great, but I hope I get into the Honors College at the University of Michigan. Uh, I guess tonight is gonna be curtains for the governor of Taxachusetts, he, 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 he. <laughs> <laughs> I enter the ballroom, a dark gap-toothed immigrant wearing sweat socks and brown penny loafers and my special and only suit, a highly flammable polyester number. I navigate the room filled with sparkling Anglo-Americans clutching single malts without a word said in my direction, without a pair of happy blue eyes reflecting the gray sheen of the crisp nylon tie I had bought for two dollars from a Broadway vendor. As George Herbert Walker Bush racks up state after state on the big screen above us, as cheers and laughter circulate around the massively hideous ballroom, I stand alone in a corner biting down on my plastic cup filled with ginger ale and swatting the colorful balloons that seem to have an affinity for my static-inducing polyester <laughs> until a pair of teenage blonde lovelies, the girls I've been waiting for all my life, finally approach with needy smiles on their faces, one of them beckoning for me to come hither with her hand. <gasps> I'm so excited. I somehow fail to see myself for who I am, a short teenage boy, born to a failing superpower, trapped inside a shiny gunmetal jacket, carrying about a mop of the darkest hair in the room, darker even than Michael Dukakis's Hellenic do. Which one will be my Jane? Which one will trace the W of my weak chin with her pewter fingers? Which one will take me on her boat and introduce me to the millionaire and his wife? You know something, Daddy? Gary survived communist Russia just so he could join the GOP. <laughs> I think that's very courageous, son. Would you like to throw the old pigskin around me, with me and Jack Kemp after cocktails? <laughs> just leave your topsiders in the mudroom. <laughs> hey, one of the lovelies says. Me, debonair and concerned. Hey. So, I'll have a rum and coke, just a splash of ice and a lime. Mandy, you said no ice, right? She'll have a diet coke, lime, no ice. I've been mistaken for the waiter. <laughs> and the next day, I'm a Democrat. <laughs> Amazing how this works. I could have been in the tea party by now. Like so many relatives of mine. <laughs> And for the last section, I thought I'd just backtrack to our first days in America, you know, coming to the country. In 1979, from the former Soviet Union, wasn't just crossing a time zone, it was being teleported to a different and much better planet. Uh, it was, felt like a pure science fiction movie, a kind of advanced civilization. The first Chevrolet Corvette that you saw, thinking it was an airplane without wings. 
The first momentous thing that happened to me in Kew Gardens, Queens, is that I fall in love with cereal boxes. We are too poor to afford toys at this point, but we do have to eat. Cereal is food, well, sort of. It tastes grainy, easy, and light with a hint of false fruitiness. It tastes the way America feels. I'm obsessed with the fact that many cereal boxes come with prizes inside, which seem to me an unprecedented miracle, something for nothing. My favorite comes in a box of a cereal called Honeycombs, a box featuring a healthy, freckled white kid whom I begin to see as an important role model on a bike flying through the sky. What you get inside each box of honeycombs are small license plates which can be tied to the back of your bicycle. The license plates are much smaller than the real thing, but they have a nice metallic heft to them. I keep getting Michigan, a very simple plate with letters on a, white letters on a black base. I trace the word with my fingers. I speak it aloud, getting most of the sounds wrong. Me, shu, gan. What I need now, in a very serious way, is to get an actual bike. In America, the distance between wanting something and having it delivered right to your living room is not terribly great. I want a bike, so some rich American neighbor, they're all unspeakably rich, gives me a bike. A rusted red monstrosity with the spokes coming dangerously undone, but what do you want? I tie the license plate to the bicycle and I spend most of my day wondering which plate to use, citrus sunny Florida or snowy Vermont. This is what America is about, choice. I don't have much choice in pals, but there's a one-eyed girl in our building complex whom I've sort of befriended. She's tiny and scrappy and poor just like us. We're suspicious of each other at first, but I'm an immigrant and she has one eye, so we're even. <laughs> the girl rides around on a half-broken bike just like mine and she keeps falling and scraping herself. Rumor is that's how she lost her eye. And bawling whenever her palms get blooded, bloodied, her blonde hair raised up to the sky. One day she sees me riding my banged up bicycle with the honeycomb's license plate clanging behind me and she screams, Michigan, Michigan! And I ride ahead smiling and tooting my bike horn, proud of the English letters that are attached somewhere below my ass. Michigan, she screams, Michigan! With its bluish black license plate, the color of my friend's remaining eye. Michigan! With its delicious American name, Michigan. How lucky one must be to live there. Thank you. Thanks a lot. That was fantastic. Um, uh, we'll uh, now have a time for some questions. So uh, if you'd like to line up behind the microphone or if you're close, if you could just speak really loudly, that would, uh, uh, that would work too. Uh, while you're all gathering your great thoughts. I have a, I have a question. Uh, or complaints. I, I, or I, complaints. I, you know, usually I get a lot of those. Like, how dare you, et cetera. So um, you clearly have a lot of fun uh, poking fun at academics and academia. Uh, throughout your works, this is a theme. And having been in academia, I can see there's a lot, a lot of material there. Um, but now <laughs> you're on the other side. Uh, uh, has this changed your thoughts at all? or? Well, um, I was afraid to write about academia until I got tenure, and now <laughs> <laughs> the sky is the limit. Um, you know, I mean, academia is fascinating because you get a bunch of really smart people often doing things that aren't so smart. Uh, mm -hmm. That, to me, is absolutely wonderful. And, <laughs> you know, the, my favorite novel, and I teach, it, uh, I teach a class called The Immigr Immigrants A Go-Go, which is sort of immigrant writers, you know, being themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of the, my favorite novels, probably my favorite novel in the world, is Nabokov's Pnin, mm -hmm. uh, which I teach with great relish, which is, of course, a novel set in Wayne Dell College, or Cornell, as it was better known. <laughs> um, and Nabokov, I, I, and so that's my favorite novel, and I've always wanted to write something like that. The problem, I think, is nobody wants an academic novel anymore. I think after Pnin, mm -hmm. after um, Postcards from an Institution, after David Lodge's Lodge, whole yeah, oeuvre, yeah. there's really not much room left for a funny academic novel, which is too bad. Uh, Nabokov was an amazing instructor. I, I wish that I spoke with his accent uh, and could tell my students the kind of things he said. He, he had a poetry student at one point who said, you know, uh, Mr. Nab Mr. Nabby, uh, you know, how do I become a poet? And, and Nabokov pointed to a tree outside the kind of said, what is this? And the guy said, well, it's a tree. And Nabokov said, you will never be a poet. <laughs> uh, so now with tenure, I'm allowed to do that and also to come in Mm -hmm. Not wearing a shirt, um, <laughs> which are all important things. Um, but I love academia. It's nice to be here. I teach one semester a year, and I, you know, it's weird. I kind of mm -hmm. almost miss it when I'm not here. Uh, the camaraderie is great. There's smart people. 
uh, all we need is for Morningside Heights to have uh, food that's you know edible, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then then we will then I could live here forever. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, no, please. Hi. Hi. Um, so one of the lines from your book says, "Born to a failing superpower." There is a recent poll done um, within Russia that said a large part of the population believes that it's returning to superpower status. And uh, the title of this article was actually Russian Society Experiencing Delusions of Grandeur. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, it's an interesting thought. You know, um, just I think last year I was in Moscow or a year and a half before the recent uh, fun stuff happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I was being driven to Shiremetyevo and the, the airport, and the cab driver was drunk out of his mind and <laughs> crying, you know. Um, <laughs> luckily, the traffic moves, you know, right. at one kilometer an hour. But he was crying. He said, I can't feed my family. I'm trying so hard. I can't feed my family. I want to move to the United States, but I know it's hard to get a visa, etc." And I said, you know who really loves immigrants uh, and who has a, a, a great, you know, w w which is an even richer country per capita at this point is Canada. Mm -hmm. You know, it's cold, it's wonderful. And he looked at me drunkenly and said, oh, I can only live in a superpower, you know, <laughs> which I thought was incredibly emblematic <laughs> of the Russian approach to, um, I mean, honestly, who cares if your country dominates the world or it's just doing great, you know, a la Canada or Denmark, et cetera. It's fun for us as people who are interested in policy to be close to a center like Washington um, mm -hmm. or, well, New York, Washington, that whole corridor that seems to rule a good chunk of the world. But honestly, you know, if, I was, if America fell apart and I had to move to Vancouver, I'd be okay, you know. They have really good Cambodian and Indian food there. <laughs> I would survive, you know. Um, but that whole mentality, which, which is very surprising, but this is sort of the crux of, of writing this memoir, was the idea that I was born to one superpower which fell apart, and now I live in another superpower which is not doing so hot. So everywhere I go, a superpower collapses. You know? They won't let, let me land in China anymore because they're just so worried that whatever contagion I have uh, will pass to them. Um, but it's, it's, it's an interesting idea, this idea of, of Russian grandeur, which you know, the country simply can't match economically uh, or even demographically. I mean, you know, the nicest thing about Crimea was at least it added two million <laughs> people to an ever-diminishing population. So this may be the only way that Russia can sustain itself is by taking chunks of Kazakhstan and all these other Pac-Man style, all these wonderful, <laughs> wonderful republics that are just so edible and, and filled with Russians. <laughs> yeah. Please. Oh. oh. Please, yeah. And then we'll, we'll start with it. You can... Go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, look, uh, it, it, this book hasn't been translated, but the others have been translated. Um, do they, people read them? Not really. Um, a small, weird fringe, maybe, in Moscow and Petersburg. Um, the reviews are always like, balding traitor betrays motherlands. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a positive review in, in, in Time Out Moscow. And it's all downhill from there, you know, like... Steingart pleases his American masters. <laughs> I'm like, I wish the CIA paid me or, or, or anything. UN, ISIS, whatever, Liberty Radio, help me. Anyone. Um, so, yeah, the view is pretty cynical. One, one review was very funny because it was this guy sort of bemoaning. It was when Absurdistan came out, which did the best out of all of those books, obviously. And, and so, and his complaint was, he could live in Moscow and make fun of us, but he lives in New York. And that's a kind of, kind of, mm -hmm. you know, uh, betrayal. Uh, you, you have to live here and suffer alongside us if you're going to do this kind of thing. <laughs> Makes sense, you know. Mm -hmm. I kind of understood his, his, his thesis statement. Um, actually, it's a kind of a follow-up. Oh, was yeah, ask, I didn't answer a piece of it, sorry. Yeah, but go ahead. <laughs> I was going to ask if there are any plans for your book to be translated into Russian, and if there is, if you would actually take part. In the oh, yeah, so all three books, you mean this book? Yeah. No, this book has not been yeah. sold to the rights, but the other three books are translated into yeah. Russian. Mm -hmm. uh, by, and there's translations of various quality depending on the different uh, translators who have done it. And uh, my real question, I guess, is also, um, so, you know, you obviously very, have a very humorous approach, um, and you're, there's a kind of bittersweet quality to your writing. Um, but I was wondering if 
during the writing if anything was actually kind of painful to recount or unpleasant or just heavy, you know? I'd say all of it was painful. <laughs> Can you be more specific? Painful to recount. I mean, look, this is the book that has a three-page long uh, adult in life, uh, late in life circumcision scene. Uh, yeah. It's painful, yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's a lot of... Uh, my bumper sticker doesn't say, ask me about my child's honor school. It says, ask me about my late in life uh, circumcision. Uh, <laughs> and people stop and ask. Um, yeah, look, if you're going to write a memoir, it's not going to be... If life wasn't funny enough, you shouldn't write a memoir. And if it wasn't tragic enough, you shouldn't write a memoir either. I think the best memoir is Mary Carr's Liars Club, um, Frank McCourt's Angela's Ashes, uh, are, are incredible expressions of both humor and deep sadness. And the sadness is not just, you know, the respective dysfunctional homelands you come from, Texas, Ireland, in my case, the Soviet Union, and then Queens. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's really, it has to be a, a, about family circumstances. It has to be about families that through society or through any other reason are not, are functioning with both a lot of love, because without the love it just becomes caricature, a lot of love and also a lot of culture clash. Um, what's been funny about touring with this book is, you know, Americans will get up, the native born Americans will get up and say, oh my God, little failure, that's what your mother called you? That's unconscionable. Thwacking uh, <laughs> you across the head. And then the Russians will come and say, yeah, that's my nickname too. <laughs> and can you sign this to little failure slash failed paralegal uh, slash shit for brains? Um, and others will say, I did everything they wanted. I married who they wanted. I became the lawyer they wanted me to be. And I'm still a failure. You know? So it's, the reaction has been very different among different, different groups. Uh, and I think that, that, that Russians really do think of this, the ones I meet as, as a kind of, I mean, I, that's been very touching. To, you know, as one woman said, you are our Judy Bloom." You know, <laughs> <laughs> that is high praise indeed. Who else? Say? Thanks. Uh, I wanted to express my passionate love for Superstar True Love Story. Thank you. Yeah. Ooh, spring break. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I Well, Super Sad is the one they're trying to turn into a TV series, so we're working very hard on that. Uh, that would be amazing. <laughs> With James Franco as Joshi and Paul Giamatti as Lenny, wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> <laughs> um, writing is interesting, you know. Um, I wake up pretty late. I wake up around 11, you know. I hobble. I write in bed, so I never leave bed. Someone delivers food to me. It's very Oblomov-like, you know. Uh, there's a lot of not moving. My posture is not great. I have a very weak upper back and a weak lower back and weak side backs, whatever those are. So I'm barely alive at this point. Uh, it's fun to write in bed and do other, you know, just to be in bed all day long. Um, at five, I see my shrink from five to six. Uh, a lot of authors do, and a lot of them see you on the Upper East Side. So at six, everyone gathers at Cafe Sabarsky for some Cafe Mitschlag. <laughs> and then that's a dinner until eight. Eight to 11 is drinking. 11 is the crying hour. This is when <laughs> writers realize that nobody really wants to read books anymore, and we are so in the wrong profession. So that lasts for the crying hour until midnight, and then we walk home and then wake up at 11, 11 hours of sleep, the beauty rest that <laughs> provides no beauty, uh, and then the process begins again. So that's pretty much the, the horror of the writing life today. Oh, there's, I teach at some point too, but I don't even know when. Yeah. Can we just start the part of the evening where we just tell me you how much we love you? Oh, um, God bless, thank you. Love, super sad, true love story. And, and going back to the sadness slash love, what I love also is the generosity that you offer to other um, authors. Um, speaking as someone trying to write a book, like the, the fact that you always say positive things about writing and uh, about authoring, yeah. just like you to address that. Thank you. Thank you, well, that's very sweet of you to say. Um, when I started out writing, you know, I really did think of writing as, uh, my relationship with others as being this sort of blood sport uh, where writers you know, eviscerate each other. And I wrote two reviews that I'm not proud of which were reviews that focused on 
the stuff that I found lagging in a book. And I had a professor who was sort of egging me on, saying, yeah, twist the blade more. Just, just let the... Um, and then I realized, my God, you know, we're all in this together. It's not that people shouldn't write critical reviews. Reviews should be critical, but as much as we can support each other, the better. The pie is small. That doesn't mean that we should stab for the pie with, with elongated forks. You know, I think rather it means that we should all help each other out. So I, re I retired from blurbing this week because things just got out of hand, but I did manage to blurb 150 books, which is, I think, a world record. Um, I will continue to blurb books I just issued in the New Yorker a Manifesto, who I'll continue to blurb. All my Columbia students will always be blurbed. Uh, 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 authors of my, who work with my editor agent will always be blurbed. Owner of long-haired dachshunds will be blurbed. <laughs> Uh, anyone Ukrainian will be blurbed <laughs> as recompense for what's happening. Um, anyone whose first name is Daria or last name is Lipschitz will be blurbed as well. <laughs> so there are still categories that I will blurb. But it's been a hell of a ride, you know, 150 books. I've read a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> the rest looked good, you know, like good covers, attractive authors, etc. you know. How could you say no? So, but thank you. But I do, you know, I, I, in, in the, doing this 150-day tour or whatever the hell I'm on, you know, seeing readers is very, it breaks my heart. It's just so wonderful. Uh, Philip Roth once spoke to that. You know, he said, oh, yeah, nobody reads. But, you know, if you sell 30,000 copies of a book, which back in the day was nothing, these days is a lot, he said, just picture 30,000 people walking past you, you know, and, and talking to you. And that's just a beautiful thing to think about. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question there? Hmm. And me, you yes. Yeah. Brodsky, that was cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so would you be surprised if you're in the next Olympics? <laughs> 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 more serious part of the question mm. is do you see yourself as part of the Russian literary tradition? Mm. So where mm. is your mm. place? Yeah, and this actually goes back to a question I failed mm. to answer from you also. Mm. Yeah, look, Nabokov, obviously, as a craftsman, is somebody that I've read quite a bit. Um, you know, when it, so much of my work is trying to connect with my parents in some ways and not understanding who they are. Um, and in, in a way, a weird bridge to that has been Sergei Davlatov's work, which, mm -hmm. and he used to live in the part of Forest Hills in Rigo Park. And I just met his daughter, and she was sitting next to me at a fundraiser. And I blurbed his book, of course. I always <laughs> blurbed Davlatov. Um, and, and it's an amazing, it's uh, Pushkin Hills, which is not even my favorite book. I love uh, Compromis. In Astranka, these are hilarious books that really straddle that kind of culture. So, Davlatov, and then moving forward, uh, the usual cast of characters: uh, Tatiana Tolstaya, um, Sorokin as a satirist. You know, he, he is the one that you look to, and he's been able to predict the ridiculousness of Putin era rule with such incredible panache. Um, and I'm sorry, the first question: Oh, do I see? Yes, the do I see myself? ever being in the Sochi Olympics? <laughs> no, no, obviously not. Um, am I in the tradition of Russian writers? Only to the point that I love the Russian language so much and that it has been in these four books to such a large extent. I've taught American readers how to curse in Russian and I feel that that's an important achievement. Uh, they go around slinging these words, you know, uh, with abandon. Um, and so it's wonderful, you know, you see someone in, in St. Petersburg sitting at, a, at the Idiot Cafe reading Absurdistan and, and, and learning how to use the words correctly. Uh, that's been fun. But look, I, let's be honest, I mean, I'm not, I'm someone who came here at age seven. I still speak the language because my parents speak it and because I go back every year. But so much has been lost. That connection has been lost a long time ago. I find Russia to be a very difficult country in which I couldn't raise a kid. I just had a kid, and I just I couldn't do that to him, you know. <laughs> Life is so short. Um, and, uh, but I will say this, that the Russian love of literature is, is Russia's most wonderful point about Russia, you know. When Sarokin wrote uh, Golubboya Sala, Blue Lard, this uh, book, uh, there was this iconic scene of, of Khrushchev and Stalin making love. Hmm. And hundreds and thousands of pensioners got upset, uh, Stalinist pensioners, because Khrushchev was on top of Stalin, <laughs> and not the other way around. So they built a giant wooden toilet outside of the Bolshoi in which they flushed down, symbolically, copies of blue lard. This may say, seem horrible to us, but in what other country does literature matter enough 
for pensioners to build a gigantic wooden toilet <laughs> outside of the preeminent cultural institution and flush down copies <laughs> of someone's work. Um, on the other hand, I was invited to speak at St. Petersburg State University, one of the two main universities in Russia, uh, on literature. And I was very scared because I thought here was a, a room full of women, because men don't bother with the humanities uh, in Russia. You know, so a room full of women, their boyfriends in leather jackets were standing outside waiting for them to be finished with this crap. Um, <laughs> And I was expecting these really tough questions about serfdom and you know Turgenev's view of <laughs> Alexander II, whatever. And but the first question was the <laughs> beautiful woman gets up and says, "So, uh, Avatar, are they going to make that into a novel or what?" <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, it's really over for literature on both sides of <laughs> the ocean. Yeah. That's a question. Uh, Yeah, it's baby. Uh, four years. They, they may got it wrong. 2000. I publish every four years. <laughs> the four-year plan. Yeah. Can you just maybe talk a little bit about your thoughts? Sure, sure. Well, I wanted to do something different. Um, after a memoir, which is intensely about me, I thought, hey, enough about me. Let's deal with somebody else. So I wanted a character who's everything I'm not, uh, a, a woman. Uh, I had a lot of fun with Super Sad True Love Story writing about a Korean-American protagonist. I think this one will be half Korean-American, mm -hmm. uh, half... Uh, I haven't thought, maybe something like Canadian. Because <laughs> I love screwing Canada. I got into this whole, I offended Canadian literature terribly through a tweet or something. No, I got drunk and I said something in an interview. And so I had to fly to Canada and apologize to the Ontario Arts Council. <laughs> Talk about people that take literature seriously. Um, so maybe half Canadian so I could skewer them some more mm -hmm. uh, and half Korean. And um, mm -hmm. I want it set in a lot of financial capitals, uh, Shanghai, Mumbai, Dubai, anything with an I. <laughs> at the end will be fun. Uh, I do a lot of travel writing, so I have all this experience in travel uh, and being in all these different places, and I kind of wanted to put it to good use. And, but I just wanted to have a woman sort of walk, going around places killing people, uh, <laughs> which is so different from what I do in Little Failure, uh, <laughs> which is just slowly killing myself. Uh, <laughs> but it's fun to change things around. Yeah. Christine, do you want to actually go in the back first and then in the front? I don't listen to Lube all day long, uh, <laughs> uh, if that's the question. Do I watch it? I've seen some of them. Um, you know, that and books. There were all those stupid, you know, Banditsky, Peterburg type mm -hmm. books. Mm -hmm. It's just in the culture. Everyone knows that you put a landmine and blow people up. You know, that sort mm -hmm. of intrinsic Leningrad, Petersburg knowledge that people have <laughs> is how do you dispose of someone, you know? Um, so it's just following the news was a lot of it. I, I still, I love reading, you know, Sloan or Gazeta or all that mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, but in the 90s, of course, it was a lot more exciting. I mean, there was, what was that firefight? I can't remember the name of the, what was the street? It was right in the center of town where there were these two cars and they, nobody wanted to give way and they just started shooting each other. You know. <laughs> um, it's fun. I've always loved uh, the American mafia tradition. Uh, the Sopranos is the end-all, be-all for me. Of, uh, so it was exciting to see this happen in, in a land that I'm you know, tangentially involved with. Uh, and, and, you know, this, the whole, the bratva and stuff, it's... I loved it when they started wearing better clothes, you know, <laughs> and, and moved to London. I think that was a really exciting uh, thing for me when, the, you know, the tracksuit gave way to the Izods. Yeah. That was an impressive movement in Russian history, you know. Um, uh. Hi. Uh, there was some mention of the immigrants in your novel, sure. in your memoir, uh, which is respectful to us immigrants uh, yeah. in the audience. Well, in my immigrant agogo class, we teach. Uh, we start with Nabokov's Pnin. No, we start. We start with Henry Ross' Call It Sleep, 
which is incredibly beautiful self-hating immigrant stuff. Uh, <laughs> then we get to Nabokov's Pnin, which is Nabokov loved himself too much to be a self-hating immigrant. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we really delve into the canon. Uh, Chang Ray Lee's native speaker, which is about a self-hating Korean immigrant. Um, then Judo Diaz is drowned. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff out there. Um, and uh, do I see myself as part of that canon? Yeah, really, very much so. Uh, we have an incredible following in American, uh, among American readers because Americans don't like books in translation. That's too weird, you know. Bleh, it's not even in English originally. <laughs> but the immigrant serves as a nice kind of bridge between, you know, so they're here, they're not smelly anymore, uh, and they speak in our language, so let's read that. Uh, mm -hmm. And we can laugh along because they hate themselves as well. Um, so that's been good. That's been really a good career move, I, I, I think, <laughs> in general. Drunk out of my mind. Uh, <laughs> I have a series of photographs with me and my best friend uh, in his, uh, he lives in Kupchina, which is this godforsaken part of, of St. Petersburg, and Oh my God, these selfies are out of control. Uh, just <laughs> different parts. He's Ukrainian, so we go the Gorilka route. And that's, oh. Gorilka is, is pretty impressive. Uh, the, um, yeah, because I, it's hard to deal with it without that kind of, you know, you need to medicate almost immediately. <laughs> uh, but I bring American drugs into it, you know, Ativan, Lorazepam, Xanax. Uh, hmm? So I like to diversify uh, <laughs> when I'm there. I'm never happy there, but it's always been, I mean, again, you know, this next book probably will, will maybe be a chapter about Moscow, but pretty much it won't be about Russian themes. But, you know, in dealing with Russia, I've had to go there all the time, and that takes a lot of yeah. m emotional and psychological effort because I'm at the place, I'm at the ground zero where all, where my parents became who they are. My parents, by the way, have not read the book. They don't read English that well, so um, hopefully they'll never read it because <laughs> they don't speak English. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully it'll never be translated into Russian, so win-win for me. Um, <laughs> But I do like to, uh, you know, the books I've written about Russia celebrate the maximalist part of the Russian spirit, uh, and that requires a kind of lubrication and, and you know, getting, you know, three in the morning somebody gets up on top of a statue of a tank somewhere in the middle of nowhere and delivers a speech uh, mm -hmm. about their mother, and, and that to, or mothers in general, or women, you know, these broad categories, and, and that to me is, is life in Russia. Yes. Oh yeah, very useful degree. Yeah, <laughs> you can end up here. At the, at the That's good. That'll that'll help. Yeah. This is one of my students, by the way. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no, no, I really appreciate that. Thanks a lot. This is the same with this guy. <laughs> Gotta move on. <laughs> right, the other class. Yeah. <laughs> Very simply, how did I make that decision? Parents. Um, it was my uh, pre law type thing. I went to the Oberlin Institute for Special People, whatever, the, where everyone majored in, you know, Gary studies or their, you know, uh, the Beatles, but I had to have a real major. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was obvious to my parents that I couldn't do med school. That's the, that was their preference, you know. But too dumb for med school, so what is he going to do with his life? Uh, the parents in Russia always say, who are you by profession? Even today they would ask, but who are you by profession? I'd say, I'm a writer, but no, but really, what do you do, you know? <laughs> um, so, to, you know, to my, um, to my parents, doing a, pre, uh, a, a poli sci was a, a concession saying, Hey, you're spending a hundred grand. You're at Barnard, according to your t-shirt, your sweatshirt, right? Uh, it was probably what two hundred grand now, right? So back then, in, in the '90s, it was only a hundred. Um, you were spending a hundred grand. What the hell, you know? What are you going to do with your life? As I said, I'll have a minor in creative writing, which is what I really wanted to do, uh, but I'll major in, in uh, poli sci. Uh, uh, and it, it was hilarious because it, it, at Oberlin, it was all Marxist professors and. Uh, I talk about this in, in Little Failure, how they had, you know, there was the, the People's Audi TT, Audi TT Roadster, uh, <laughs> the People's Espresso Maker with a big red star on it, and um, we tried to reconcile Marxism with our spectacular lifestyles, um, and it took a lot of doing. Um, but I almost, I'm glad that I majored in something other than English or creative writing, and that I had a, an understanding of the world a little bit, you know? Uh, that's my recommendation to writers is to have a world that's outside of writing. So, you know, 
look at Chekhov, you know, being a doctor, how much that helped him understand the world and, and be close to the world. Uh, get a medical degree if you want to be a writer. Um, it's always good to mix, it's always good to have a profession. So poli sci, you know, whatever, economics, that, that's a good thing to have to understand how the world works. Now that I'm writing this book that has all these financial elements, God, how I wish I'd taken more than just intro to econ. Uh, my life would be so much easier. Now I'm like a student with, you know, ten dozens of textbooks trying to figure out, you know, how, you know, financial meltdowns occur. Boy, it's complicated. Anything else? Uh, in, in researching this memoir, you went to Russia uh, a number of times, but then I guess I'm right, you went every single summer. Um, has anything surprised you, or has it reinforced your pride for us or impressions? It just... It keeps on going, you know. It's it's um, there was a restaurant in Petersburg called 1913, and I asked the owner why 1913. She said, "Well, it was the only good year in Russian history." <laughs> you know, <laughs> it just it just keeps on giving, you know. <laughs> the satire of it, the outrageousness of what's happening now in the Ukraine. You know, what was that joke you were telling me? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, go ahead. So Putin uh, is on the phone, and he says, "No, I want you to move your border away from our tanks." <laughs> That's what I love. One of the first jokes I remember as a child, just growing up, you know, my parents would tell this Brezhnev jokes. This is 1980, the, the, Brezhnev, the uh, Moscow Olympics. Uh, Brezhnev is completely senile, barely alive at this point. He has to give a speech. So he walks up to the podium. You probably know this joke. And he has a piece of paper in front of him, and he starts reading it. And he says, Oh! 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 And his assistant runs up and says, no, Comrade General Secretary, those are just the Olympic rings. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great joke. And, and the fact that these jokes continue, to okay. me, that's Russia. So you don't want to live in it, but you, know, you want to observe it. A and you want to, because it's, just, it's, so, it's such rich material. Um, and what else do I love about it? The language continues to, just hearing people talk in the street, it get very emotional. Um, in, in America, you hear people in, speaking Russian, but it's this quasi-Russian English, you know, that, uh, you know, but in, in, in Russia, it's, well, it, it's, there's a lot of English words, too, you know, Chorny PR and stuff like that, but it, it's, it, it is wonderful, um, but it's sad, you know, because it, it to one step forward, two steps back, you know, it's just, there's never any discreet feeling of hope, and the mentality doesn't change. It, it changes for a select group of, you know, middle-class Muscovites who are, you know, internet connected and know which protests to go to and things like that. But for the vast, you, you forget that, you know, outside of Moscow there's this gigantic country attached to it, um, which has a mind of its own, obviously. And so I get, I really do get depressed. And, and even, you know, I, I always limited myself to two, three weeks. But boy, when I pass Pulkova control, <laughs> And that Austrian airliner is humming away, and I just think, I'm gone again. You know, I'm gone. And then I come back, ten days of Wellbutrin, and then <laughs> back to being me, whatever that is now. Are you speaking Russian to your son? No, no. Um, he's six months old. Um, my wife is a Korean American, so it would have to be Russian and Korean. Uh, which is too much. So he'll just learn Mandarin like everyone else. <laughs> so food features very prominently in, in your work. Yeah. So where do you eat in New York? Unless you oh. have like secrets you don't want no, to reveal. No, no. Uh, um, I'm a huge eater. Uh, um, <laughs> Thai food is one of my favorite foods. Um, Uncle Boone's on Spring Street is amazing. Mm -hmm. You got to try it out. <laughs> Um, I always get the name wrong. I love a really spicy Thai papaya salad. Yeah. Suntander, which is on Avenue A and on, I think 6th Street, has the spiciest papaya salad. Mm -hmm. um, the best food is always in Queens. Yeah. Uh, well, there's a great Korean restaurant that's a Fort Lee, Fort Lee, New Jersey has great Korean food. Um, Manangosai, which is 35 West 35th Street, has a really good um, short ribs uh, and, and a micro brisket, which is a very mm -hmm. thinly sliced brisket. Um, Russian food just isn't good, so don't use it. Um, 
Oh, they opened up the branch of that restaurant in uh, Moscow, yeah. the, the Ukrainian yeah, one. Yeah, um, yeah. Taras, Taras Bulba. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, where I went before all the unpleasantness happened. Yeah. Uh, that's, so when the food that I love so much is sala, which yeah. is just lard. Oh, yeah. uh, and, and, and when I was growing up, my father would tell me these stories called Planeta Zhidov, the planet of the Yids, <laughs> which would be a planet, this is when he would take me around, and this is how I became sort of a satirist, is he would tell me these stories of a planet of Jews living on this planet who were constantly being bombed by lard torpedoes uh, <laughs> sent out by the space Slavs. And the Jews were protected by Captain Sharansky. Um, <laughs> and all this talk about lard torpedoes made me very hard and hungry for lard. Uh, <laughs> so that's a great place to get lard yeah. uh, cool. and to pay penance for the yeah. invasion. Yeah. Great. Good. Any, thank you very much. Uh, uh, any other questions? I no. think we're. Uh, I just want to oh, thank. Yeah. Oh, is there one more? No. no. Okay. Down. Can I have one more question? Please. <laughs> the major question. Yes. Uh, uh, not very oh, uh, um, business school is good. Yeah. Most of my writing and jokes are outsourced to India, so they're <laughs> they're actually funnier than I am. Yeah. That's the best question I think I've had in a long time. Um, I don't know. Funny. Uh, I had funny parents, you know, they're, they're very funny. Even, even in their cruelty, they're funny. Like, Failure Chica was my mother's nickname for me, Little Failure, you know, that's pretty funny. Or my father called me Snotty. Um, th those are funny, you know, depressing but funny things. That, humor is only funny when there's something tragic behind it, you know, so that's why Jews are so good at humor. It's this kind of humor from the edge of the grave. Um, but humor is very hard to get. I don't understand. I'm very bad at, at, you know, like I lived in Italy for a while and I would look at Italian shows on, on, on you know, on TV. And I always thought that the humor was just so non-sophisticated compared to our Daily Show or, you know, or Colbert Report. Um, it was always so slapstick and so based on physical comedy, which is the lowest form, unless it's done really brilliantly by Chaplin-esque type people. Uh, I have to do an article for GQ where I have to hang out in... Um, with a Chinese comedian in Beijing for like a month. Um, and I speak, of course, no Mandarin, so this will be <laughs> hilarious. They'll be explaining the jokes to me like three ways mm -hmm. through. But I want to, like, what's funny in China? I want to figure that out, you know, uh, and, and maybe improve upon it. Because mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I was listening to, they were already playing some jokes for me, and they're like, this all is about, you know, um, like how people in Shanghai do this, but people in Chengdu do that, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm like, oh, that doesn't sound that funny, okay. <laughs> right, because that's very elemental humor. Um, but coming from a messed up society does help. Um, you want some kind of, laughing at leaders is great, you know. When, when W, you know, when the W era was over, I was like, oh, no. Because <laughs> as a satirist, I mean, Obama's been fun, too, but as a satirist, you know, humor works really, satire really works best when evil and stupidity collide, <laughs> you know. Uh, that is yeah. great. And, and Russia does that, you know, in spades. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I would look for. Mm -hmm. But good luck. I mean, I think it's sweet that you want to step into the shoes of funny, yeah. <laughs> So I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, we've got uh, books for sale, uh, right? And uh, uh, we've also got an interview with Gary that's uh, coming up in the Harem Magazine. I wanted to plug both of those. But also, I want to thank Gary Steingart. Oh, sure, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. May Igor Steinhorn, May Jerry Steinhorn. Yeah, call me good. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you all for coming. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.